to the final Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences seminar. And uh, this, this term, oh, this month we have an outside visitor, Dr. Terence McGonigal from Brandon University in the Department of Biology. And a brief introduction to Terry. He did his PhD on the soil biology of a seasonally flooded hay meadow in England, and that's why he doesn't have an accent. Um, he then spent seven years at Ontario Agricultural College in Guelph, working on mycorrhizae in corn, soybean, and ginseng. Um, the following three years at, at, at OAC were looking at uh, manure and nitrogen for corn. He then traveled outside of Canada, working uh, in faculty appointments in both Japan and in Idaho in the US, before settling down in 2005 at Brandon University in the Department of Biology to teach plant courses. Um, as part of his research mandate, uh, Terry is again looking at mycorrhiza and livestock, including farming systems. So there's a strong emphasis on sustainable agriculture that would be associated with uh, the activities of nickel here in our faculty. Although the focus in the presentation today is on agriculture, Terry has always maintained an interest in conservation, including studies in Canada on soil plant relationships on the prairies and in the tundra. So if you can please give a warm welcome to Terry for Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to the uh, to, to, to Martin and the faculty uh, faculty of um, agriculture and food sciences for the invitation to uh, to present uh, today. And I'll be talking uh, over about 50 minutes here. I've got uh, some slides to talk about soil biology and variation in relation to uh, space and time. And I'll be looking to find uh, some generalisation there. And uh, to, to, to cut a long story short, it's going to be about the mechanism and the process that's going to determine that, uh, that scale for, for time and, and space. And at the end, uh, uh, briefly, I'll be looking at some, some data for microbes, uh, for bacteria in, in soil. So just to illustrate, for illustrative purposes, some of the new uh, uh, methodologies coming on, online, uh, next generation sequencing, for uh, giving us a window on on the soil bi biota. So I'll slide advance here, here we go. So what systems will I be considering here today? I'll talk about our vascular mycorrhizae, looking at uh, ginseng, and also looking at uh, corn from Ontario. Manure amendment, looking at the various manures in corn systems in Ontario. Soil organic carbon enrichment by vegetation. I'll be switching gears there to talk about some, uh, some semi-arid systems and uh, uh, changes in soil organic carbon with depth through time. And then uh, soil health under land management, we're we'll looking at uh, 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 comparing cropland and grassland, uh, looking at what is soil health and how can we measure that? Uh, is it helpful? Uh, uh, what, does, what does it mean? And uh, in relation to grazing systems as well, uh, continuous and planned uh, grazing. And, and the very last point, how about species of microbes there on the on the, on the end. So mycorrhiza to begin then, uh, we look at mycorrhiza in roots, we can stain the roots, we can see the fungus, and uh, we have high feed of mycelium there. We can see that there are various colonized areas across a, a root system, and then we have uh, the extra radical or external mycelium can link from one colonized area to another. We might see vesicles, which are food storage bodies, to, uh, to, to allow for regrowth from older roots. We can see points of entry there the uh, impressorium, these are staying with acid fruits then. And then look at the arbuscles. The best pictures of arbuscles were taken by Larry Peterson's group in Groff and the credits given there. Here's a, an arbuscle, so that's filling a cell, and uh, the typical form there, the arbuscle enters the cell and divides uh, on a trunk dichotomously to form a little tree that it is, giving a high surface area of contact between the fungus and the plant for exchange. We're going to have sucrose moving from the plant the fungus, phosphate in exchange from the fungus to the plant. It's a symbiotic, mutualistic uh, relationship between the two. And we can look at uh, some other plants, that uh, form changes very slightly. There's another form of arbuscule, functionally uh, equivalent. In, this is ginseng here, where there are coils uh, in the roots, and then at different loci on the coil, you get the arbusculate branches occurring. That's 
the same there. The function is the same, it's a little different in, in form. So colonization is dynamic. I want to talk about changes in time, variation in time and space. And it's a dynamic process. Going back to Barbara Moss, the David Stripley, Francois Le Tapon in 81, that the model of, of this change in percent of root length colonized with time is uh, the, the sigmoid shape is a lag period, uh, a steep percent, and then, and then a plateau. And so um, that's our, our starting point to consider the colonization. So I go to Ontario, here's a ginseng garden. They put the canopy over to, uh, to exclude 80% of the light to simulate the situation as it were in the, in the forest. And uh, the crop is going to be in the field for, uh, for four years. And uh, that's a risky business. You've got a lot of investment, a lot of money tied up in that field. And the whole thing could get wiped out by a disease like cylindra carpon fungus. So there was interest at that time to say, well, are these plants mycorrhizal? Um, we'd like to know that because that could be beneficial maybe to fortify the plants and repel the pathogenic fungi. So I was part of a study there to, to look at the colonization for those plants. So we wanted to. To, to model the colonization. So I came up with using a logistic equation there to summarize the, uh, the relationship. We, uh, it's quite simple to, to formulate this, the colonization against time. And then, of course, we have a plateau, CP. So we can, in, in part B here, you can see just adjusting the plateau. OK, so then we have two other things to control the curve. There's TI, the point of inflection. Halfway up the curve, our maximum slope is at our point of inflection, so you can adjust TI and see there's different curves there. And then lastly, this component K, as you see in part A, which uh, I, I refer to as the abruptness, which is a, a measure of how much a bend there is in the curve. In A, you've got the same plateau, the same TI, but if you've got a higher value of G, you've got more wow uh, in the curve. And so for our, 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 our measure of lag phase, the delay in colonization, that would be you need to look at both TI and K to characterize it. So in the ginseng garden, then, uh, there were some volunteer uh, first year plants in the second year bed. And that provided an excellent opportunity to do a bit of basic research on an applied system. We have in 1995 our first year plants, in 1996 our second year plants, but we had these late germination first year plants. So under identical environmental conditions, we've got first-year plants alongside second-year plants. Uh, and then we can make that comparison. Most of our data for colonization is from, from annual cropping systems. And here's a perennial. And uh, we looked at the roots um, in September and then again in May. And you could see that the fungus had, uh, had, had died back. The roots were still there. The same root length of the plant was there in May. But the fungus had died back. It has to rebuild in the second year, rebuild the mycorrhiza. So we looked at the first year plants in the second year bed, and you can look at the curve, and you can see the lag phase seems to be uh, extended. And the second year plants are ready to go. They can rebuild that mycorrhiza much more quickly. And uh, so I wanted to characterize that, so I came up with this uh, property F50, which is the 50 being 50% 50 of the maximum slope. So halfway in terms of slope, halfway to the point of inflection, and that would combine TI and K as a, as a metric. And here's the data for having fitted the, uh, the, the logistic uh, 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 equation. We have uh, for the, the uh, first year plants in a second year bed, 38 days to 50% of maximum slope, whereas only 13 days to that point for the second year plants. So I can conclude a quite interesting point about the biology here, that just a centimeter away, perhaps, these plants are made next to each other in the same bed. Just, just centimeters away, we've got a quite different experience. The second year root has a high inoculum potential around it from the dieback of the first year growth. Whereas the first year plant in the second year bed, it's got, it's got all to do, it's got to rebuild everything from scratch, and it doesn't have that higher elevated inoculum density next to it. It takes longer to build up, starting as if it's in. So the scale here, is, is very much at the, at the scale of the root. Turn to corn in Ontario. And uh, root length, uh, centimeters of root length per mill of soil through time. 
coming up to a peak at 100 days, uh, and then the roots dis uh, disappearing somewhat, two centimeters per mil, and uh, appearance of brown roots by, by decay there. So that's our uh, n equals 16, quite a lot of work going into that one. And we look at the, the, the shoot peak concentration. There, this was an experiment where we had a, a low disturbance treatments of no-till and rich-till compared to a high disturbance treatment of mold or cow. Rich-till was low disturbance because there's an interrow cultivation of the previous year, uh, reinforcing the, 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 the accumulation of soil around the, the row. And the next year, planting, cutting off the top of the row, uh, the ridge, as it were, and planting into the top of the ridge. So where below the seed, there's no disturbance from the previous year. So it's a low disturbance treatment. And between 30 and 40 days, we've got significant elevation of shoot phosphorus concentration relative to mold or plow in these low disturbance treatments. And that's associated with differences in the mycorrhiza. Here's the arbuscular colonization. The percent of root length with arbuscules phase out the planting. You can see the significant differences here are exactly at that time. Here, with the mobile plow, less colonization. So we have association between the occurrence of the mycorrhiza and the uh, expected function for phosphorus uptake in that case. Well, I'm going to summarize my different points as I go along. Summary for mycorrhizae before I move on. Changing space is at the scale of the roots when it comes to mycorrhizae, it seems. And then the temporal patterns are associated with nutrient uptake, at least it seems, for uh, corn. The slurry slinger, there's Jim Ferguson, the technician, uh, putting out the uh, liquid uh, manure. So the slurry slinger, you pump in the uh, liquid manure to another volume and then you fire it out again on your plots. So that's a fun job. And, uh, and the, the me how do you know? You say you want 40 gallons, right? So the measure was there was this piece of two by four with nails in it from the, the, like a meter diameter drum. And, you, and that's the, the, the stuff is pumped into the slurry stream. You go down another nail, I said, yeah, another nail has 10 gallons in it. So that was high tech to load the thing. And we have, and then there's this pier there was spreading out the solid cattle manure on the plots and plowing it all in. So this was a big experiment. And um, you can hardly see that because it's small, but I've overridden the frequency. Liquid cattle, liquid swine, straw-based poultry, wood-based poultry, uh, solid cattle, so cattle plus wood and straw amendments, so urea and control, 23 treatments, four replicates, that's 92 plots, three different sets of 92 plots, one for each of three years of study. Uh, the rates there, uh, it's 100, 200, kil uh, 300 kilograms in per hectare for the manure, <coughs> and then half that for the urea, 50, 150, 100. Uh, kilograms and per hectare for the urea control. So a big experiment. And uh, we were able to model changes with time. We saw, uh, we saw mineral in, the nitrate and ammonium, kilograms per hectare, phase out the plant. So we got a graph like that for all 23 uh, treatments, one, one each for 23 treatments for each of three years. So here's the urea, 50 kilograms and per hectare, year one. The four replicates you can see there. So your mineral end goes up, of course everybody knows this. It goes up because of favorable temperature and moisture, and it goes down because the uptake by the plants exceeds the mineralization. Okay, we get a maximum there about around about the 10th of June. And we can model the plants too. We've got days after planting, we've got shoot in, kilograms per hectare, and again one point there for each lot. And then we can uh, look at yields. In the next graph at each point is for a single treatment. There we go. So this yield, you can relate yield to soil mineral, and the 23 points on each graph we relate yield to uh, to our soil mineral end, mineral end at planting. It, it, it'll, it'll relate well, correlate well at different times. Uh, planting is given there. It, it rises to a plateau. Shoot end, kilograms per hectare, the yield is correlated uh, in a linear manner. Best correlation at 10th of July. And then you can combine the two, soil mineral end plus shoot end, you can tighten up the curve a little bit there by bringing them together. But the most interesting finding from this study was if you took out the manure separate from the urea, during the three years, yield against soil mineral end um, at, uh, at the 10th of June, 
and uh, three different years, and you get a different curve, reliably. So control all urea, um, so we've got our three urea levels plus our control, and then all the other, if we the, the 19 and the near treatments. That's telling me that this difference of a half to 1.0 um, tons per hectare uh, difference in yield is telling me that post the 10th of June, you're going to get more from the manure. You haven't seen everything yet from the manure at the 10th of June. There's more to come. And uh, uh, the timing of release then is, is underlying. So my, uh, my time uh, in, uh, in Brandon, I have looked at some, uh, some uh, organic systems there. Been adding some uh, compost manure to this a commercial farm for, uh, for, for, for uh, certified organic agriculture, seven year rotation, um, and four years applied compost manure. Why does he apply compost manure? Because there will be too many weed seeds in a fresh manure. So, because he can't apply an herbicide. So, there's the quality of the stuff, the, the, the CN ratio there between 11 and 18. And we varied the rate of application of the compost manure by changing the speed of the manure spreader going faster and slower. So the plots are 30 feet wide and 100 yards long. And uh, so it's kind of rough and ready. And we put out tarps to check the, the, the rates of people being added. And over, to cut a long story short, at least four, four years of the study, absolutely no discernible response from this compost manure addition. Soil N, soil P. Early season shoot N, shoot P, grain, grain N, grain P, no response, zero response. In the fourth year, we thought, well, really hammer this thing. We've we'll got absolutely lots of, of uh, compost. We went up to 20 tons dry mass per hectare. Several, like 40 fold is normal rate. Really hitting, I can see it on the field. You can see the compost coming. Still no response, nothing. We've got, uh, here's our yield, NP concentration in the grain, no significant, it's complete blank in all our This is telling me that the, the, the manure compost is on a different time frame for breakdown, so completely. Beyond the, the, the time frame of seven year uh, organic rotation, this is long term replenishment of soil organic matter, soil, uh, soil uh, uh, nitrogen in a different time frame. And his, his uh, fertility for his current rotation cycle is going to be to the cycle of three years of alfalfa and a couple of all those Summary for manure and soil in. Soil mineral in maximum about 10 to June. Yield can be modeled on soil mineral in and early season shoot in. Yield following manure addition will exceed expectation based on peak soil mineral in, it seems. And when you're compost subject to multi-year dynamics, it's really different stuff indeed. Let me change gears altogether and go to Idaho. The sagebrush, cold desert, it's a, it's a white landscape in the winter. And you can see here in the sagebrush, there's bunch grasses and plenty of open soil here as well. And um, I spent four happy years in Idaho. And uh, of course there's the Department of Energy, they do uh, uh, research on uh, 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 nuclear reactors for, for peaceful use there in the development and testing and so on. And they have contaminated waste. They get uh, cesium uh, contamination on things like gloves and what have you. So that you have to wait a couple of hundred years for it to cool off. A couple of hundred, you have to go through several half lives to get so they buried in the ground, low level waste. And they, they were covered over with soil. And of course, they don't want any water to get to the waste. So they want it to be vegetated to return all the 20, uh, 225 millimeters of precipitation. Return that as evapotranspiration to the air. And they also don't want roots to get down into the waste, and they don't want animals to burrow down into the waste. So they put in a barrier, the so-called bio-barrier, of this cobble and, and gravel. And so various cap designs were tested in this experiment. The EPA design has a liner and a clay layer as well. So I thought this was a wonderful opportunity because it was set up eight years before I got there. Uh, it was set up in 1993. And I could see that the, the soil they used was from a subsoil source. It, 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 was, it was a subsoil they brought in from a distant location. 
with low organic, uh, with low organic matter. So I can say, here's an eight-year starting point. I can look at the development of soil organic carbon uh, with depth and in relation to the vegetation over a fixed period of eight years. I can see how, how far has it come along in eight years? Can we see stratification with depth of organic carbon? Can we see differences under the canopy compared to the open? And uh, so here's the building the experiment back in 93. Uh, and I sampled then in 2001. There was an irrigation treatment. There were some planting treatments, either sagebrush or uh, uh, crested wheatgrass cover. Here are the plots then in 2001. The depths from a half an inch down to five inches. And soil organic carbon, boxy black, grams per kilogram. And it's, uh, it's getting up to 12. So we can see a canopy effect. We can definitely see it's higher under the, uh, the sagebrush canopy compared to the open. And our baseline, the only measure I have, because I can't go back in time, but the only measure I have at the starting point, our best estimate would be about five. From what we have at depth, about five grams per kilogram. So we've gone up a fair way. So we need to know well, how far is that towards this conclusion? What's the situation in the mature sagebrush community? So we went out to the mature sagebrush, and there isn't the, 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 the crest of wheatgrass. So we, there was a, a common grass there, an Indian rice grass we were able to say. And here's the mature case. It gets under the sagebrush. It gets, it gets up to 21, or up to 2.1% uh, organic carbon. So we're partway there in eight years. And you can see the, the canopy effect is evident throughout greater depths, and also evident with the rice grass as well. So I was able to summarize all of that. How long would it take to regenerate the mature community? Calculated that as 32 years. Uh, vegetation can be effect evident after eight years. Estimate 32 years under ambient precipitation, because those, those data were averages across all the treatments. But uh, for under ambient, 32 years. I thought that was pretty, pretty quick. That's pretty good to get to build up your organic enrichment underneath the canopy. Uh, but it would likely be much longer to enrich the soil between the plants because you have to have vegetation cycling where plants would appear and disappear over uh, uh, many decades. The next part of my talk, I'm moving on again, soil health, soil health. What is soil health? And of course, um, uh, uh, it's, it's definition based on productivity. What is our level of production of, of forage, perhaps, or uh, our uh, annual weight gain? on that forage so production. But wouldn't it be nice to have an indicator? Wouldn't it be nice to take a, a handful of soil and say, let's measure the soil health on this soil right now, and we can predict in the future what we will get, rather than waiting for a production event. Let's have an indicator. What would that indicator be? What should we use? Some people have said, well, soil organic carbon is going to be important. Um, I thought, well, what about microbial biomass carbon? If you look at other things being equal, if your temperature, your moisture, your sunlight are all balanced, then you're limited by nutrients. Well, microbes contribute to the availability of nutrients through, through mineralization. Microbes contribute to the uptake of the nutrients through mycorrhiza. So what about measuring microbial biomass? We can measure microbial biomass. We can fumigate the soil with chloroform, and we can release the, the, the soluble carbon from the microbes. We can estimate microbial biomass carbon. What about using that? Is that going to tell us anything helpful? There are methods presented um, in the literature and industry to use a respiration burst from uh, workers in Texas, Haney and, 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 and colleagues in Texas. A respiration carbon dioxide burst is another suggested way to measure soil health. So uh, if we're going to evaluate these indicators, do they work, what's good, what works, uh, then we need to have a higher and lower soil health to, to compare them to. So uh, let's talk about grassland and cropland. What would we expect? Well, if soil health is being driven by the uh, input of carbon from living roots to soil, if it's living roots that are giving through exudates and root death, uh, ultimately, to feed the carbon below ground, then you'd expect higher soil health than in a grassland compared to a cropland on that, that thought. Because you would have, uh, in, in cropland, you would have uh, uh, bare soil in between plants and fallow periods within the year. There's the grassland soil, complete cover everywhere all the time. 
So maybe we predict then higher soil health for grassland and compared to cropland by that, that uh, consideration. In grazing systems, we can apply the same logic and look at continuous and plant and look at so what's, the, what's the higher soil health here. In continuous, you put the cattle out season long on the, uh, on the field, uh, and then you have selective grazing. You, the cattle will uh, favor some uh, uh, forage over others, and we'll get patchiness. So there'll be overgrazing here, undergrazing there, and of course, then we will have uh, perhaps a, a degradation of the, of the forage with time and reduction in, in, the, in the health. Uh, there's also the, the uh, if you go to plant grazing instead, where you put higher density of cattle in a small uh, paddock for a short time and then move them on to the next paddock, then you have this higher density. Then, the selectivity is eliminated. They must eat everything because they, they're so crowded in such a short time. They eat everything. And then uh, you get this nice long rest period, 60 to 90 days, where you will have recovery. And, and once again, well, that feeding of the carbon below the ground from the living roots of the pasture to fortify once again the soil health. So we might predict then that we have higher soil health under plant grazing, perhaps, relative to, to continuous grazing. So I had a look at the literature. This is a meta-analysis of um, microbial biomass carbon against soil organic carbon. And each point is from a separate trial. And the trials are worldwide. Uh, there's data in here from Holland, from Illinois, from Manitoba. It's from all over. And uh, we get two different lines for grassland and cropland. Uh, in each case, they're, they're positive uh, linear. But we've got a steeper slope for the grassland. So that's telling me that for the same soil organic carbon, we're getting more microbes in the grassland compared to the cropland. Well, that's encouraging that maybe microbial biomass carbon is in some way related to soil health. That's encouraging. Maybe it does tell us something. Let's look at um, grazing, perhaps. Well, how long does it take to get there? when we uh, go from a pasture into a cropping system, data of spalling. He was in New Zealand. The, the publication was in the Australian Journal. So he went from pasture into maize. And he calls that, 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 uh, that relationship between microbial biomass carbon and, and soil organic carbon the quotient. If I just slip back and give you the percent, I put the percent in there. 2.7% is the slope of the line. And 1.1% is the slope of the line there. So those are basically the, the slope, it's the, the, the one divided by the other. Uh, he called it the quotient. So here's his total organic carbon, here's his microbial carbon. And he came down from 2.2% down to 1.4% four years. He found four years from that. That's, that's a time frame for that transition from pasture to, to maize by that, that reckoning, four years. So we go to Brookdale, north of Brandon, in uh, uh, collaboration with uh, this is Manitoba Beef and Foraging in Initiatives, and, uh, working with uh, Ben Friesen and uh, Pine Pam and Ira Tesco, who are running this experiment there. And uh, we have two different grazing treatments, continuous grazing and plant grazing, the red for continuous. And um, the, the, the plots here are marked out, um, the, the red is for continuous, and it's a replicated and randomized design. With, we have a complete continuity in the continuous grazing, A through G. The little blue marks are not real on the ground. They're just lines on the photo. The cattle can move freely all the way from A through to G in the red. And then the, the, the plant grazing, the yellow, uh, divide up. Those are real fences. And even within those smaller paddock units, they, those, these are uh, uh, with time they're subdivided by temporary fencing. To move the cattle at about 25 uh, 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 cow, uh, cow pairs in, a, in, an eight, in, a, in one acre, and just there for a day or so before being moved on. So they're, they're being moved on through the experiment. So we can look at the soil health here, perhaps look at the soil properties in this experiment and see what we get. So here's our microbial biomass carbon against soil organic carbon. 240 points across the experiment in 2016. Each soil core kept separate. Each core taken at random coordinates. 
And uh, so there's a bit scattered, but we've got a good relationship. I was really happy to see that the grassland was behaving like a grassland. That was good. Two and a half percent is the slope of the line. So I'm happy about that. So there's a clay variable across the site. Remember I said I kept all the cores separate. It, as clay goes up, we've got from 5 to 30 percent clay. What's causing that? Is it related to some, some legacy of, of a glaciation where clay was being deposited from melting ice and Apache or Manor? Was there some kind of soil, selective soil movement historically that I don't know about? Was, was there erosion moving clays around or something? But whatever caused it, we've got patchiness in clay on the landscape. Stand here, you go 10 meters, 20 meters, it changes. It's, it's different. And there, we've got, as we get more clay, we get less microbial fiber. And that, there's quite a bit of literature on, 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 on the notion that the microbes are excluded from small voids. The small voids between the small clay particles are a refuge, a physical, physical protection of the organic matter that microbes can't get to it according to what we read. So that would make sense then. We've got less microbes with higher clay from a physical protection. But when we look to compare the continuous and the plant, this is for one replica only in, uh, in, in, in 2016, so there's much more data than this, but overall, we're not seeing any response to the grazing treatments in terms of the microbial biomass carbon, the plant of the continuous. Thus far, after two years, no discernible response in, in microbial biomass carbon. So how do I interpret that? Is, is microbial biomass, is it, is it useless? as a measure of soil health, or is it that the soil health difference has not yet been generated? We need more time, perhaps, to answer that. I go to Wikipedia and look at soil respiration. Uh, I want to get into talking about that first method, and um, as another measure, method of uh, measuring soil health. And so soil respiration, here's the temperature, the temperature function, um, the, the units that soil respiration is measured with a chamber on the on the soil surface. I switch the units to milligrams per kilogram per day, so we get uh, two to four. That's the kind of level it is then. Soil respiration in the, in the field undisturbed. Fair enough. So the burst then, well, the burst method from uh, from Texas, what they're doing is they dry the soil first, air dry the soil and then rewet it to 50% water holding capacity. And then you capture your carbon dioxide release with a sodium hydroxide trap and you titrate them. They have other methods, other methods to measure it too, but it's the same basic experiment. So there's a dry wet cycle. So here's some data from Haney and colleagues. 36 soils in the one case with a dry wet cycle, uh, pH varying, across quite a range, um, the uh, uh, soil organic carbon varying across quite a range there, and our burst is between 5 and 70 milligrams per kilogram per day. Well, that's a lot more than our basal respiration in the field. It's getting 2 to 4, it's now gone up to up to 70. That, that's a real burst. That's a, a real burst of respiration here compared to what's happening in the native soil. And you can you can elevate it by adding some organic compost in the dairy manure you've got at elevation up to 50. So you can certainly see there's a burst of carbon dioxide here that's coming off. And the question would be, what is it like if you use a field moist soil? I wonder, can we see, does this drying have an, an impact? Dry it, air dry it, rewet it. What if you just took field moist soil and did the same thing? And that study was actually done. The lower, the lower figure here is for uh, the, uh, the the respiration. Each pair is for a different soil. The data is from Miranda et al. 2012. And uh, you can see here, here's the here's the burst. Here's the burst. The stimulation of respiration by it's all about the drying. You dry the soil and re-wet it, and bang, off comes the carbon dioxide. And interestingly, uh, Miranda et al. measured the fumigation uh, microbial biomass carbon as well. And, you're losing about 15% on average. It varies by soil, but overall 15% loss of microbes by a drying, 
re-wetting cycle. Surely that must contribute in part, and maybe in whole, but certainly at least in part, to this respiration burst by the catastrophic event of killing microbes with a dry re-wetting event. That's what it's perhaps really measuring, it would seem. So my summary, the soil health. Our ratio, our quotient, biomass carbon over soil organic carbon, 2 to 3% for grassland, 1% for crop plant. It's modified by, uh, the, the biomass is modified by clay heterogeneity. This is at scales of tens of meters across the field. Carbon dioxide burst appears to relate to the dry wet cycle microbe loss. And the grazing system's time frame, that's what we really need to know. How long do you need to, to, to change soil health in there? And to, to build in the productivity data of those systems as it becomes available for uh, the, the collaborators. And I'm going to move into the, the last part here to talk about um, uh, beyond the considerations of uh, time and space, what about species? Consider a different microbe species. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating, in my opinion, what is happening in current times, even within the last handful of years, things are moving on so quickly in microbiology for soils with measuring the different bacteria or fungi that are present using so-called next generation sequencing, where you can you take an extract of soil. Metagenomics just means taking an environmental DNA or, or other nucleic acid extract. Okay, so you feel collected nucleic acid as opposed to from culture. So that's metagenomics. And then our applicon, well, what you do is you, you can take your, your soil sample, a fraction of a gram, and you can extract the DNA. You get all the, this, this DNA. You've got 10 to the 9 bacteria per gram, so you get all kinds of bacteria there, all kinds of fungi there, all mixed up together, a hippie jumble, a soup of DNA. And then you can use primers that will be specific for whatever organism you want. So you go for bacteria. You can go 16S primers for bacteria. It's the ribosomal RNA gene for bacteria. Pick out the bacteria. And with the next generation sequencing, though, you can land the, uh, the, the amplicon, which is your, 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 your length of base pairs uh, uh, stimulated. You can land that on multiple, each one separate uh, from, from, from each different fragment of DNA uh, in, your, in, your, um, in, in, in your extract. You can land them at different nodes on the grid. And you can sequence at each node. So you can get not only the, the, the primer activity to, to, to build your amplicon, but you can also sequence your amplicon. So with a single soil sample extract, you can generate thousands of so-called reads, each read corresponding to a run of base pairs from a different bacteria. And it's like it would be like going out to the prairie to count species of plants and putting down a pin into the field and saying which leaf touches the pin, and say, okay, that's a rose, that's one count, that's one read. And essentially, what each of these nodes on the grid, and there are thousands and thousands for your, 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 your next generation sequence, is like putting another pin down into the soil and saying which bacteria touches this pin. And you get a sample of relative abundance. So here's some data from 2017. Um, Soybean rhizosphere, so to sample the rhizosphere soil then, take the plant from the ground quickly, abruptly, whip it out of the ground, and the soil that adheres to the root system is rhizosphere soil, and we brush it off with a paintbrush. And we've got so a little pinch of soil, less than a gram, extract the DNA, put it through for 16S primer, um, next generation sequencing, 250 base pairs, amplicon. This sample then, this is one, so there's one soil sample and you can get hundreds of soil samples. And your number of reads, we've got 6,700 6, reads on this system. The number of reads doesn't really uh, reflect an intrinsic property of the sample, it's just a sampling effort. You could, we could have not 7,000 reads, but you know, we could have 100,000 reads or 7 million reads. It's, it's all about your sampling effort, that's what it really reflects. So we've got all these reads, so almost 7,000 reads, and here's, we organize our bacteria uh, with 305 different bacteria, and uh, some of them, of course, you get repeated reads because there's more, there, there's more bacteria present for that species. So, and you can order them in a rank order. So here's our most common first, 
and our rare ones. So we have here our number of reads up to 700, and they gather a long tail of only one read each of these. So this is the so-called um, species rank abundance distribution, the log normal curve, and it's absolutely classic for, sort of, for, for biology in general. Whether you're looking at birds or beetles or flowers or anything, you look at species rank abundance patterns, they follow this pattern of a few really common species and a long, long list of rare ones. That's just a part of being in, in planet Earth biology. That it's one of the fundamental questions in ecology, why? But we're not going to go there today. But that's, that, that's fundamental. Why is it like that? But it is like that. And here it is with the soil bacteria for soybean prices, for example, in Manitoba last, uh, last year. So then we can have a look at who's who. We can say, who, let's look at the top 10. Pick the top 10. OK, there's the top 10. The blue, we're the top 10. Um, <clears throat> 703 reeds, down to 122 reeds. So 10% of the reeds are the first bacteria. But what we notice here is a couple of things. Most of the common bacteria cannot be cultured. They're uncultured. And they show up in the, in, in the metagenomic analysis. And then who are they? There's the acidobacteria and chloroflexi well represented here. These are, these are groups that we don't normally think of when we consider rhizosphere and soil systems. Now, so prior to at least the, the use of uh, molecular data, we, we wouldn't, wouldn't have been expected to see these guys. Wouldn't we? Here are some of the, I picked out some familiar names from further down the list. Uh, rank 64 through uh, almost 300. Here's some familiar names. We've got uh, Nitrobacter, Bacillus, Rhizobium, Pseudomonas. They're way down the list. We're a fraction of 1% of reeds here for these kinds. Much more uncommon in the rhizosphere soil uh, as compared to the, uh, these other perhaps less familiar. So what's going on here is the, the new methods are instructing us that we're going to take a chapter on soil bacteria and maybe have to rewrite it. It's going to have to be, these are, these are groundbreaking data over these current years. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating that this is going to change the whole understanding of, of the soil bacteria. So our summary on next generation sequencing, we've got a data challenge. Uh, and that was just one soil sample. And I have the data too for the fungi. I used a different primer from the same sample for the, the, the fungal, the fungal uh, Abundance. I can show you that afterwards. So I have that. Um, the species rank abundance curve uh, marches on. Uh, so yeah, sure, it's, it's true for each biological taxon we look at. It's true here for the soil microbiology as well. Common bacteria cannot be cultured, and understanding of dominant taxa is currently being rewritten with these uh, emerging studies. And the, the, the really big thing here is going to be able to how, how, how to handle this data and get it organised process to summarize. So I want to summarize the whole talk in a slide for this afternoon. And I've got one major conclusion. Scale relates to process. Uh, I'm looking at how things vary in time and space. And um, let me summarize that through those examples. Um, we're looking at space at the root. We're talking about millimeters because the process here is the uh, uh, the build-up of, uh, of inoculum density in proximity to colonized roots and how that differs from one millimeter position to another across the soil. So our scale there is dictated by the mechanism or process. But if we look at the canopy and the inputs of, uh, of organic carbon from the shoot and the root system, that's being driven at, at, uh, uh, at the scale of the planet, isn't it? It's below the canopy or in the open and then to the surface of the soil and accumulating at the surface. It's, it's being driven by that, that, that plant scale there. If we go to the landscape where we've got uh, discontinuity in clay deposition, our soil microbiology is, is changing as we march across the field over tens of meters and we, we change a bit of soil texture going a bit more clay, a bit less clay. Our microbiology changes there. So our, our depositional history, our legacy perhaps, or, or our soil movements, erosion history, that's playing a part on maybe 
the, the, the process or mechanism at work there. So it depends. Our scale here is depending on is what we're talking about, the process and mechanism. And the same with time. If we're looking at drying a soil and killing 15% of the microbes biomass, then that's, that's a catastrophe that happens more or less instantly. But our, our phenology for bacterial uh, uh, activity, that's going to be driven by the, the season. Phenology is changing the season. So it's our temperature and moisture are going to drive those seasonal effects like our increase in nitrate and decrease in, in, with time. It's going to be uh, where there's a, a biological component of the activity of the microbes or the activity of the plants that, or the crop, then that's our, that's our phenology there uh, driven by the biological nature of the interaction with the temperature and moisture of the environment. But if we move to a longer time frame, residues, transformation, the breakdown, the transformation, stabilization, organic uh, residues going to organic matter, we all well know from our, our, our training, of course, that these are long-term processes in, in many years. It changes again by process. The residues become stabilized. And my second main conclusion, we've got a, a new frontier for species uh, roles here. What are they doing? Who's who and what are they doing are, are, uh, are really uh, an expanding area to consider. And my last, very last slide in the set is uh, acknowledging mentors, collaborators, and students over the years for the work I've enjoyed uh, in this uh, investigation of soil biology. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you, Terry. So, questions? Um, so, 
also uh, this forms part of a uh, master's project coming to its conclusion at Brandon University at this time. So I'd be very interested to see that data to see if that indeed plays out. I had a glance, you made a sort of generalized table, but uh, I just did an extract table there and summarized that one sample, but in a more generalized table combining different source samples. And, and the species list gets longer quickly. So I think it's likely to be something approaching of what you described for these uh, insects. They go from one tree to the next and the list of insects jumps. I, I would expect something similar. We'll see. With insects, they're using data such as this from all over the world to extrapolate how many species there might be undescribed. Is anybody doing that with bacteria? Is that way in the future again? I know, well, I know the one estimate for world species for fungi from David Hawksworth, where he looks at the, uh, he's the best study, uh, well studied case in the British Isles, how many species of fungi described, and then how many species of plants described for the UK. And then look at how many species of plants for the planet. And just by proportion, uh, I think he got 3 million species of fungi, so he rounded it down to a million. <laughs> you had mentioned, uh, go ahead. What do you see that are the long term implications of uh, that drop that you mentioned uh, between the grassland and the croplands, the dropping or, or changing the slope? In the long term, what can that mean? For, for, for switching over from a pasture to a crop plant system and the changing, we, we, we know well, of course, we, we expect a, a reduction in soil organic carbon in total because of uh, increased uh, disturbance in soil aeration and, and respiration and so on. And then what I'm, that data is telling us is at the same time, we, we, we're changing the, the, the quantity of microbes associated with that. So what's the, what are the, what, what's the significance of that uh, you know, in the long term? Yeah. So it, we expect then, of course, that microbes are contributing to the functions that we know microbes have, like, like mineralization and, and, and nutrient uptake. So presumably, it's going to be reflected in the retardation of those processes by reduced quantities. And there's a more reliance on it.
if my question is, does that magnetic bond that's going to look the same in bulk soil? The reason I ask is because we have a whole bunch of data in my student space. Just the right just the right just can see that. Does the shape of the curve, I, would ex I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at that study from Gustavo, uh, is, um, is, uh, is in the assisted model extracting the species. That's only looking at the, the, um, the rhizosphere samples. Rhizosphere, actually, it has the biggest study is rhizosphere from soybean uh, from healthy plants and diseased plants is actually what's But we don't have a bulk source. But uh, there is, I can tell you about the composition who's the who's who rather than the shape of the curve. Uh, I do have this slide for that. Extra slides. <laughs> <laughs> Extra slides. Okay. <laughs> there, there's the fungi. Let's get through the fungi. And this is this is a Borgarelli. Borgarelli et al. 2012. And um, they actually looked at uh, this is a, 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 a Arabidopsis plant. There's, there's the box soil and the rhizosphere and inside the root. And this illustrates to me that for the rhizosphere, we're getting a similar story with abundance of chloroflexi and well-represented acidobacterium. And that's similar in composition to the bulk soil. But it changes remarkably when you go inside the root. And we get something much more familiar with abundance of proteobacteria, where we're going to find uh, such players as Rhizobiaceae, Pseudomonadaceae are much more familiar names inside the root, but it's our rhizosphere and presumably a very similar story in the, in the bulk soil, but these more unfamiliar players. Based on the knowledge of the entire planet for all biota, we'd expect the shape of the curve on a single sample to be the same. Looking forward to seeing <laughs> So you mentioned that the, those bacteria could not be cultured. Do you mean that they could not be cultured or they have not been cultured? They have not been cultured. And so they're known only from environmental to get any samples and metagenomic analysis. They're only known from their DNA. They've not been yet found in a way that no way has been found yet to convince them to enter into culture growth. Presumably, uh, with the right conditions, it could be done, but no one's figured that out. Any final questions for Professor McGonigal? Go ahead. Um, from what you said, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but it sounded to me like you weren't all that confident in the reliability of any of the, the kind of soil health tests that you were looking at. Um, do you have any comments on what avenues we might pursue for a more reliable indicator of soil health? It's a really good question. What I'd want to do is to get more comparative data for systems that we have confidence in saying this is a healthy system and this is a less healthy system, so that we can pin it to that and say, well, if we if you had confidence to say this is healthy and this isn't, and say our potential indicators when the mind works and which one tells us the right story. Uh, but it's, it's getting that that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that backdrop of, of, of our benchmark of this is healthy, this isn't, with so many, of course, uh, variables from case to case, time to time, site history to site history. So I, I think that's where I'd really like to go with it. Um, before, I, I, and then if we dismiss, microbial uh, biomass carbon, you know, if you say, wait, we thought it might tell us something, but actually it's very limited what it tells us. Let's consider something else, maybe it's going to be ATP or something else, because it's our good indicator, or it's nematodes, maybe it's nematodes, right? Who knows? Okay, whatever it is then, to, to, to really nail that down, we need to know what's healthy and what's not healthy, rather than, oh, I just expect, at the moment we're talking about expectations. But what do I measure, to sh apart from production? What do I measure? Okay, 
Okay, well, if everyone could just give us a round of applause for Professor McCarthy.